Good morning, church. Today I want to give God all the glory, all the honour and all the praise. I want to thank our Heavenly Father for sending his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross. He died on the cross for you and he died on the cross for me. He loves you and he loves me. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today at our Cliff Walk service. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this new day. We thank you for this new morning. We thank you, mighty Jesus, that your love is new every morning and great is your faithfulness. Father, we thank you for who you are, the great and mighty God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lamb of God. Majestic name above all names, and Father, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess, O oh God, that you are Lord. Thank you for this new day, Almighty God. Thank you, O oh God, that we can come before your throne of grace and hear what you have to say to us today, Almighty Jesus. Let your will be done, Almighty God, as we hear your words, listen to your words, Almighty God. Open our hearts, open our minds, Almighty Jesus, and let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, mighty Jesus. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, I'm going to be reading from Psalms 117. The Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations, Extol him, all ye peoples, for great is his love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Amen.
Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Today's reading is from Psalm 37, verses 1 to 11. Psalm 37, verses 1 to 11. I'll give you all a second to find it. This is what the Lord says in Psalm 37, verses 1 to 11. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon disappear. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you, Polly. The English language is continually changing. Some words fall out of favour, like the word thou or ye or hearken. And new words come in such as emoji and Brexit. And another new word that in the last five to ten years has become part of everyday language 
is the word well-being. Is it one word? Is it two? Or is it hyphenated? Or according to the dictionary, it could be one word or hyphenated. And the dictionary says, defines it as such, a condition of existence, a state characterised by health, happiness and prosperity. Those things are important. But fundamentally, that definition is flawed in that it excludes over half the world's population from experiencing well-being because they don't have access to material prosperity. And it misses out on the most important thing of all, our spiritual condition. Last Sunday, we reminded ourselves that God created us body, mind and spirit. He created us as human beings as such in order that we can have a relationship with him. A God who is, in essence, spirit. So when Jesus came and talked to his disciples, teaching them about his kingdom, he didn't use the word well-being or tell them that their lives needed to be characterised by health, happiness and prosperity. But he did say to them that they would be blessed. Blessed. Eight times he said this to them in what we now call the Beatitudes, which are the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' first teaching for his disciples. We began to look at this last Sunday, and we saw that his disciples are blessed in belonging to his kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. How it's an open invitation for all to join this kingdom in which God rules by peace, love and justice. In order to join, we need to recognise our own spiritual poverty. That we can't earn an entry pass, we can't click and find an online voucher to get into the kingdom. We must know that we are poor in spirit and cannot save ourselves. It is only by accepting God's grace and love that we join his kingdom. So I want to continue this morning to look at the next uh, of these blessings in Matthew chapter 5. The next one reads as follows. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This is another one which appears contradictory, doesn't it? Upside down, the wrong way round. Blessed are those who mourn. Mourning is a common feature in every culture. In our British culture, we tend not to show so much our emotion. But that doesn't mean we don't mourn. In Africa, I've seen and I've heard a whole village displaying their mourning about the death of a chief's son. In one West African country, you're expected to spend more on your funeral than you do on your wedding in order to show how much you're mourning. The sorrow and sadness and the grief we feel about death, the death of a loved one, is very real. And let me be clear, it's okay to mourn, to cry, to feel sad. The Bible tells us there's a time to mourn. And it records that Jesus wept at the grave of his dear friend Lazarus. On the first Easter day, the disciples, they, again the Bible says they were mourning and weeping when Mary came into the room and told them that she'd seen the risen Jesus. There's mourning right across our nation and every nation at the moment. And that is right at the time of such sadness, at the time of such loss. I'm reading a book at the moment on the different views of world religions about joy. Many say that to know joy, we need to ignore and keep away from things that are negative and make us feel sad and only focus our lives on positive things. Indeed, there's an old, an old British song which says, pack up your troubles in an old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. That's not really the Jesus way. Because Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. 
We need to face our sadness. We need to face up to our sorrow. We need to experience our grief. In Jewish culture, that, that, at that time, there was also the tradition of putting on sackcloth and ashes to show how much you were mourning. This wasn't just about when someone died either. When the prophet Jonah finally goes to the city of Nineveh, he tells them that God will judge them for their sin. The king hears about this and we read, he rose from his throne, took off his robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. He then called on the people to do the same. And the story goes on, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion on them and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. It's the account in Jonah 3. The people of Nineveh mourned about their sin. We read on Palm Sunday that Jesus, as he approached Jerusalem, standing on the Mount of Olives, looking across to the city, he wept as he thought about how the people of that city were going to reject him in the days to come. How they would betray him and crucify him. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 7, says this, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Do you and I know from personal experience this kind of sorrow and mourning? Mourning about our sin, mourning about how offensive, how much we have offended God by the things we have done, by the things we have thought, by the right things we have not done. These are what caused Jesus to die upon the cross. Does our sorrow, godly sorrow, bring us to repentance, bring us to turn away from our sin and turn towards God? If it does, as Paul's words say, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. God rescuing us. God saving us. Jesus expects his disciples to be people who mourn about their sin. Have godly sorrow. And what about the sin in the world around us? As Christians, we should mourn about that too. It was just over 200 years ago that a man called William Wilberforce was deeply saddened and grieved by the slave trade operated from British ships. And so he dedicated his life to get that stopped. What grieves you and I about the world around us? Is it the trade in drugs? Is it the abuse of children? The trafficking of people? The lack of clean water and food for millions every day? Do we mourn? Where are the modern day William Wilberforces dedicating their lives to stopping these evils? Or is it because we see so much of it that we become indifferent? Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Paul writing in 2 Corinthians 1 says this, praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. The God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. Isn't that wonderful this morning? Whatever our troubles are, God can comfort us, come alongside us, strengthen us, reassure us that we're not alone whether our troubles are related to the virus or whatever, makes no difference, of course, with God. David, in the famous Psalm 23, says this, doesn't he? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And our mourning about our sin, God's great comfort about that is, of course, his forgiveness, his complete forgiveness, his absolute forgiveness. 
for our sin, saving us from the penalty of our sin. This incredible free gift of salvation which he gives us, which we receive because of his grace and love towards us when we trust in him. This is the amazing comfort that he gives us. And about the sins around us, let's do all that we can to bring an end to them. And as we do, God will come alongside us and strengthen us, just like he did with William Wilberforce. Jesus said, blessed are you when you mourn, for you will be comforted. And so we go on to the next one that Jesus says, where he says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Yet another upside down statement, the wrong way round, isn't it, really? How can the meek inherit anything? To succeed in this world, you've got to be assertive. You've got to get your own way. You've got to dominate. And that's the opposite of being meek, isn't it? We never hear politicians saying, vote for me because I'm meek. Or army commanders saying the best way we can conquer this land is by being meek. But Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they, they will inherit the earth. David, the second king of Israel, he wrestled a lot with this issue. Polly read earlier from Psalm 37, and that's just one of a many psalms in which he, he shares his struggle about good and evil, strength and weakness, right and wrong, the truth. Who's winning? What will happen in the end? Do you know who the meekest man was in the Old Testament? It tells us. In Numbers 12, it says this in the authorised version. It says, Moses was very meek above all men which were upon the face of the earth. Moses, the man who killed an Egyptian, stood up to Pharaoh led the Israelites marching out of Egypt, chased by the Egyptian army. For 40 years led them around the desert, during which time he smashed the first Ten Commandments, hit rocks in frustration, etc., etc. And yet he's described there as the meekest man on the earth. More recent translations use the word humble. And Jesus said this in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That word uh, translated there, gentle, is the same Greek word as translated meek in Matthew 5 in the Beatitudes. Jesus was meek, gentle and humble in heart, he said. You see, in the first instance and primarily, meekness and gentleness and humility are attitudes of our heart especially in relation to God. It describes our submission to him, our seeking to follow his way, our acceptance that he knows best for our lives, placing him at the centre rather than ourselves. Now, of course, that attitude will have then show itself in our actions. And so Paul wrote to the church at Colossians saying, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness or meekness and patience. Hey, how we need these things in our world, don't we? But we need to start with ourselves as the people of God. And are we clothed with compassion? Are we clothed with kindness? Are we clothed with humility? Are we clothed with gentleness, meekness? and patience in our dealings with others, even in our homes at this time, where relationships may be difficult, clothe ourselves with those things. 
Now, if we, can, if we are clothed with those things, then we are blessed, said Jesus, in that we will inherit the earth. Inherit the earth. Wow. Down the years, there have been many strange inheritances reported in the media. Weird and extraordinary things. If someone left me their pet, that would be really weird. Because people don't... No, I don't really like animals like that. I was once given the opportunity to take a stuffed animal from someone who died, but no thank you. Here is the greatest inheritance of all, isn't it? The meek will inherit the earth. What is going to happen to this world? What is going to happen to the earth? You and I, as God's children, are going to inherit it. That's what Jesus said. So, whilst lots of other things are said about what will come, and many of them may be true, there may be a lot of, there are enormous issues about the state of this physical earth. In the end, Jesus said, the meek will inherit it. You see, Romans 8 says to us, as God's children, we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, that we may share in his glory. We're co-heirs with the Lord Jesus to share, to inherit into his glory. That's crazy, but it's true, because we've got an incredible God who wants to us to be in this kind of eternal relationship with him is this amazing God your God this morning we focused on two challenging verses do we mourn our sin do we mourn the sins of the world are we submissive to God's will accepting that that's the best thing for us if so jesus says we are blessed blessed big time by god himself let us pray together lord jesus we thank you for these words of yours which we've reflected upon this morning and we acknowledge that you've called us as your disciples to live so very differently from the way the world sees things. But Lord, we want to be different. We know that this world needs us to be different. Most of all, you desire that we are different. So Lord, help us to mourn about those things which you mourn about. Help us to show that meekness and gentleness which you, Lord Jesus, showed as you sought to do the Father's will May we seek to do the same. And Lord, as we bow before you in prayer this morning, we again commit to you our government, that they may be wise in the decisions which they make in these coming days. And we commit to you our families and our friends. And humbly pray your care and protection around them. Father, we ask these things. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know if it's anyone's birthday this week in the fellowship, but if it is your birthday this week, have a happy birthday. May God really bless you. And this evening at 6.30 we'll be live streaming in Portuguese on Wednesday. Uh, there'll be a Zoom prayer meeting and Bible study. So this week, let us continue to let our light shine for Jesus. Whatever, when, wherever we are, whatever we are doing, wherever we are. And I hope you'll be able to join us next Sunday. So let's end our time as we always do as Cliff Walk Church by saying the grace together. I invite you to join in with me and say these words. May the grace 
of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We're going to uh, now share a hymn, a wonderful hymn. I know that means so much to many of us. That hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. You see, whatever the storms are around us, the most important thing is that it is well with our soul, with our spirit. That we are in that right relationship with God. So may we enjoy singing along with this great hymn which follows us. And may God bless you and keep you through this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is well